Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Tony Birch, and I'm here to represent the Wheeler Centre um, to kick off today's event. Um, just before we start, again, could you please again give an applause for that wonderfully generous and informative um, welcome to country. So because um, this is the opening session, um, I have to start with a little bit of um, housekeeping um, before I introduce my guest. Um, the first point to make is it is my birthday and it says here the chocolate and cream cake will be here as requested. Um, thank you to Sophie Black for that. Um, the second thing was to, to um, ask you to be generous in your applause following that wonderful welcome to country. So we changed the order. I thought that was more important than recognising the, the chocolate cake. Um, the next thing is, that of course, you will see today that we have um, all of the events are being Ausland interpreted. Um, the people who do this do remarkable work, incredibly creative work, I think. Um, today, um, the people with the magic hands, um, I want to thank um, Linda Dornay and Amber Richardson, so please thank them. And I just want to give a, a sense of what this day is about. And again, I've been instructed by Sophie Black that I can paraphrase um, her remarks. So as a published writer, I'll get a little bit creative with her paragraph here. Thank you. Um, so this is the Di Gribble argument, and of course it does honour the late Di Gribble, a remarkable woman. Um, Di was a true force in Australian cultural and intellectual life throughout her life. We remember her as a publisher, editor, um, important businesswoman and, and mentor, a woman who had incredible impact on the books of writing and ideas. Um, so in this year, the Di Gribble argument responds to the issue of climate change, Although I will say, I don't think there's much to argue about. We're going to be all on the same page here, I think, today. And it will honour and discuss the work of three writers, um, Bruce Pax Pascoe, Tila Watson, and um, one of our important guests today, who I'll introduce formally in a moment, Victor Stephenson. Um, we'll be talking to Victor about an essay that he has produced to kick off the discussion today, a remarkable essay. And... I've also been asked to mention our creative partners and here again being instructed by Sophie, she said I can use my own words and although she used the word thrilled, she said I don't have to say that I am thrilled, but I will. I am thrilled <laughs> to acknowledge the key partners who have made the event possible. So that is Creative Partnerships Australia, Creative Victoria, the City of Melbourne and of course all the ongoing support that we get from the Wheeler Centre donors and supporters, and of course those who attend our events, which include um, this wonderful, um, large and um, obviously appreciative audience today. And the other thing to do before we move on is to, of course, uh, to thank Di Gribble's family, members of her family for coming today, and the partners for the event, which include the Saturday paper and 7am. Um, the other thing to note, of course, a really important issue here is that um, this is a COVID safe event. And part of that means that if you've been to a Wheeler Centre event previously, you will know that we often have, well, we do have a QA and a um, built into the session. We won't be doing that today because of the COVID restrictions. Um, I imagine it's something around sharing a microphone. Maybe you should have all bought your own microphones and we could have done that. Um, but I've also, to mention Victor's essay, um, the essay is available on the Wheeler Centre site. So if you haven't read Victor's essay, please be sure to do so um, when you get the opportunity after the event. Okay, so that's that bit done. Um, now I have the real genuine pleasure to introduce our guests, um, all um, remarkable Aboriginal people who come to us today with an incredible range of experience and, and cultural understanding. So I'll introduce each of them in person, then I'll, I'll just give you a sense of how we'll kick off. So immediately um, to my left is um, Victor Stephenson, who, as I've said, produced one of the essays for the discussion today. Um, Victor Stephenson is a descendant of the Tagalaka people. Yeah through his mother's connection from the Gulf country of North Queensland, and he's the co-founder of the National Indigenous Fire Workshops and the author, by the way, of a remarkable new book, Fire Country, How Indigenous Fire Management Could Help Save Australia. 
Victor's a writer, filmmaker, musician, and consultant applying traditional knowledge values to contemporary contexts through workshops and artistic projects. Much of Victor Stephenson's work over the past 27 years has been based on the arts and reviving traditional knowledge values, particularly traditional burning through mentoring and leadership, as well as ongoing training with Aboriginal communities and many non-Indigenous Australians. Tammy Gilson is a Watharong or Watharong Baguruk woman who lives on Watharong country. And Tammy refers to this country importantly as her nan's country. And Tammy acknowledges her ancestors and elders who have walked before her. Um, Tammy Gilson works as an Aboriginal inclusion coordinator for the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning in the Gariwa Grampians region and has extensive knowledge of her cultural heritage sorry, and natural resource management, including traditional fire burning practice and mapping and cultural values. Tammy is also studying a graduate diploma in land and sea country management at Nakiri at Deakin University. And I, I want to say Tammy made the wonderfully um, humble remark when we were discussing today's event that she didn't want to be introduced as an expert. Um, she said she's not an expert on these issues and I thought that was a, actually a very generous thing to say. But it was also interesting that Jill Gallagher immediately pointed out to Tammy that she was an expert of her own story. And I think it's a great little exchange that I was able to be party to where two Aboriginal women are, are, are both talking with humility but a real sense of assertiveness over ownership of their own story and culture. And finally, Jill Gallagher, who, because I'm one myself, um, she, she's an old Fitzroy knockabout, um, but I'm going to introduce her formally um, here. So. She can take me to task about that or, or welcome that um, opening statement. But Jill Gallagher is a remarkable Aboriginal woman and we're going to talk a little bit about um, remarkable work that she's done over the past year in response to the COVID crisis. Jill Gallagher AO is a Gunditjmara woman from Western Victoria who has worked within, led and advocated for Victorian Aboriginal community health throughout her life. Since 1998, she's been through the Victorian Aboriginal she has, through, sorry, through the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, VACHO, VACHO is now one of the largest and more effective state Aboriginal peak bodies and organisations across Australia. She's been CEO since 2001 and in that period, um, Jill Gallagher has led major growth in the organisation's status by working to raise its profile and to position it as a key body in addressing Aboriginal health issues. In 2010, Jill Gallagher was included in the Victoria Honour Roll of Women and in 2013, she was appointed to the Order of Australia in recognition of her strong and effective leadership in Aboriginal health. It's important to note here though in more recent years that um, Jill Gallagher was also the former or is the former Treaty um, Advancement Commissioner um, res responding to the calls for treaty within Aboriginal communities and she worked with Aboriginal Victorians throughout the last few years in landmark reforms um, in regard to the outcome of possible treaty, which are now um, coming hopefully to some sense of fruition. So that took seven minutes. Um, we're going to start now and we're going to get right into this because there are important things that all of our speakers have to say. Um, one of the things that was really, in, to me, invaluable um, in reading Victor's essay and also looking at Victor's book is the way that for Victor and for Aboriginal people, I think, involved in protection of country generally, you don't... There, there is no separation from what whitefellas might refer to as environmental and ecological issues and what we, we would see as equally vital issues around Aboriginal health, around well-being and cultural maintenance. And I suppose to put, put it simply that... Um, I think what I learned from Victor's essay is that you must have a holistic relationship to country if you are going to protect country and, of course, if we are going to protect um, ourselves physically and psychologically. I'm actually going to start with Jill Gallagher because one of the issues that I introduced at the, the outset was that in the last um, year as the head of VATCHO, Jill Gallagher has been responsible for a remarkable response to the COVID crisis within um, the Aboriginal community across Victoria. 
As far as I know, I don't think anyone in our community died as a result of the COVID outbreak, and it required an enormous um, mechanism of people working together, people coordinating with each other. But when I met with Jill on Friday, one of the things that I discussed in responding to Victor's essay and Jill's work was that um, it seemed to me that what Vacho is doing is in fact reflecting what Victor's work is doing. One might seem on country and might, one might seem in a, in a health world, but in fact what Jill is doing is thinking holistically about how people's physical health relates to our connection to country. And in a supplementary document that um, I read of Jill's, one of the phrases that really stuck for me was in that document, Jill writes, a culture must be respected as a protective factor, so to protect our well-being. So just to start, Jill, if I could ask you to respond to that idea about the balance between our physical and mental health and our attachment to or our responsibilities to country and how you have seen them working in relationship to your, what you've done with that show. Thanks, Tony. Uh, <clears throat> before I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge that we are on Aboriginal land and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'll have to give you a little bit of a flogging later, Tony. That was an embarrassing, um, long... Um, and I'm sitting here really embarrassed about that introduction, but thank you. It was uh, well meant. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, yes, I... I um, anyways, and I can blame Nikki on that uh, for adding to it. But, yeah... Look, I am an Aboriginal woman. I'm from Western Victoria. I'm a very proud Gunditjmara woman. And um, culture has always played a very important role in all my uh, tasks that I take on in life. Whether I'm the Treaty Commissioner, whether I'm the CEO of the Peak Body for Aboriginal Health and Wellbeing, or whether any other task. Very early days, I actually worked in the Museum of Victoria repatriating uh, Aboriginal skeletal remains and cultural property back to country where it should be. Um, but the Aboriginal view of health, it is holistic. It includes connection to the land, the spirit, the physical body, the clan, the relationships, and more importantly, our laws, L-O-R-E and the social, emotional and cultural well-being of the whole community depends on our connection to our country. And as part of that connection to our country, it's our cultural responsibility to care for country. And Victor has, by the sounds of things, dedicated his life working in that area. Um, and uh, it's really important that we have our practitioners to continue that ancient and contemporary way of caring for country. Uh, the theme of this year's NADOC is heal country. So if we, can't, if we cannot protect our country, it's, we struggle to heal it. And that's really important. I am going to go on to COVID um, and well, I want to... Is that okay? That's okay. Yeah, okay. But I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about uh, Aboriginal women and our connection to country. Um, where I'm from, it's really important, and I would assume this is right across all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities on this continent, it's important to birth on country. Um, and it's important to actually introduce your baby to country. Um, and in traditional times, our, our women actually buried the placenta of our babies. And that's to introduce your child to Mother Earth. And so Mother Earth knows your baby and that's your connection to country. Um, and... That's such a beautiful, beautiful um, cultural uh, that's been around for many, many, many generations and is still practised today. During COVID, we um, 
Fat Joe is the peak body for health. We knew it was important that we came together as, as one, even though we're many, many different clans. It's so important in, 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 the, in the middle of a world pandemic. And Tony mentioned it in his introduction. Currently, there's 58,000 Aboriginal people that live in Victoria. 74 got COVID and 74 recovered. So the Aboriginal community controlled organisations came together and said, we have to deal with this as one and not in isolation of one another. We have 32 Aboriginal community controlled organisations sprinkled throughout Victoria. And those 32 Aboriginal organisations came together and helped government to make sure that our communities were protected. Um, we're less than 2% of the population here in Victoria and we could not afford one death. The innovation and the, the smart way of doing business is what I witnessed in the Aboriginal communities. The innovation of, uh, you know, in Victoria we all, we all know we had stage four lockdown, we had the uh, second wave uh, while all the other states were starting to open up we were still in stage four lockdown. And that was really hard for our people, our communities, in particular, our elders, and staying connected to that country. That was really difficult. So, but what I witnessed, I witnessed innovation. Uh, innovation as in Aboriginal organisations, a very small organisation in Halls Gap. It's called Budja Budja. It's up in Gary Word. And that little organisation knew that a lot of the Aboriginal community who lived in Gary Word didn't have access to public transport like we do here in Melbourne. <laughs> so it was, they took the health service to the house. So they went door knocking, they went testing, they went making sure people were okay, making sure elders were okay. Here in Melbourne, the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service the innovation that they showed. Um, they provided Meals on Wheels. This isn't a health service. They provided Meals on Wheels to elders. And can I say it was very gourmet Meals on Wheels and I was very envious that uh, I didn't qualify. Uh, but anyways, um, so the innovation that we witnessed throughout COVID and still today where the Aboriginal community organisations came together. Um, Look, I might leave it there, yep. Tony. And, I'm going to and come back, gonna I'm gonna come back, back to, to a few Jill, things. Um, when I come back to Jill later on, I'm going to ask her about that um, to expand on that sense of isolation and people not being physically on country, but we'll come back there. Um, Tammy, I, 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 w I was not intrigued. I was really actually enlivened by your that bio where you, you refer to country as your nan's country. Um, and in work that I know you've done, you've done work in regard to cultural burning, but when I was researching you and look at what you were doing, I saw some remarkable work that you'd done with, it looked like largely a women's workshop, but doing weaving, um, doing the eel traps. So I suppose, again, thinking of um, Victor's philosophy around um, cultural maintenance generally, it, well, it seems to me that you're invested in not just one aspect of um, cultural maintenance like burning, but the work you're doing around the weaving and stuff, again, is to see a holistic um, educational environment that you're setting up for women. Do you want to talk about that? Um, yes, thank you. Yabba uh, Willem Yal, as we're all coming together moving forward for this discussion, I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we're on today. And I want to acknowledge my brothers and sisters up here and my auntie. And it's an absolute honour for me to be here today and to come into Melbourne. Um, I guess for me, you know, cultural practice and um, who I am as a Wadawurrung woman um, is, you know, is part of my identity of who I am. And the work that I do within DELP uh, for Aboriginal inclusion is all that encompasses my cultural knowledge and my cultural practices. And, you know, every day I'm fighting, um, not fighting, but I'm trying, you know, getting recognition and acknowledgement um, with all of our stakeholders um, and for traditional owners. And, you know, as far as my weaving goes, that's all connected back through 
our fire practice as well because, you know, we're, we're out there caring for country. We're managing country in a different way or we're trying to. And we're really putting our cultural knowledges back into um, programs and trying to revitalise and bring back our resources that were um, taken away from us, as we see. Um, I find it a bit confronting sitting here looking at that big building over there. Now, I come from Gordon, which is on Water Run Country, and that, that is, you know, that's a place where my ancestors come from. And my nan, I must acknowledge my nan because I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for her. But we see across our landscape and I see that as our cultural landscape and it's full of our cultural uh, values. I see, you know, wind turbines that have gone in to country, all this infrastructure that goes into the place. And if we don't do something about it, we it's gone. Um, you know, if we don't look at our cultural heritage management plans and apply our knowledges into those plans, it's, um, it's too late. Because once something's destroyed, if a scar tree is cut down and burnt, which we've seen before, we can't get that back. And that's part of the history that links me back to my family. Um, I have some family here today, which, you know, they support me and we all support each other. And, you know, through Victor's essay, I can really see that the similarities that we all go through and striving for the one thing, and that is to become one mob of people that care for the same thing. And it all comes back to country. And through my weaving practice, that is part of me showcasing that I can do this and I'm teaching the children and the children can do it as well. And it's that continuation of that story that we want acknowledgement for. Um, I think, uh, yeah, that's, that, and I, I just want to add, um, you actually can go on YouTube and, and see some remarkable examples of, of the work that um, the community are doing. And what struck me as something so wonderful was to um, see the response of women involved in that workshop. So while it's quite physical of doing the work, yeah, the, you can see the conversation and the stories being exchanged. There's an incredible sense of energy there. So I want to come back to that as well. But... Just for now, of course, um, it's Victor um, Stephenson's essay, The Planet Is Us, that provokes this first session today. So um, thank you again, Victor, for your generosity and, and your, your wonderful writing. Um, I want to start with a, a very simple and direct question that I, I'm sure will be much more expansive when we talk about it. One of the statements that you um, make in the opening of the essay is that Mother Nature has a language and... Because of that, you talk about our need to listen to country. Could you just tell us what is that language and what is the value and the responsibility of listening? Thanks for that. Um, and lovely to be here today. And um, I'd like to acknowledge also you all for being here and also thanks for the, the welcoming through traditional custodians as well. But the uh, language from country has always been there. And that's where knowledge comes from. It comes from the landscape. And for a lot of people that have lost their connection to country or have lost um, elders, and they say to me, oh, you know, we want to learn about that, but we lost all our old people. They're gone now. But I say to them, you know, there's one elder that's still there, the oldest one of all, and that's the country. And it's the most beautiful elder because that's where all our knowledge comes from and that's where the people come from. And even yourselves have the same elder wherever you come from and all over the world. There's been people that come from that main elder, which is country. And so what it all boils down to for sharing knowledge and helping communities to revive knowledge is about um, listening to landscapes. And it's not just about the fire. It's about everything. And when we look at landscapes and country, um, you know, that's what it really is about, is reviving knowledge from landscapes. And so, for example, when someone from another country, they'll say, well, we got a gum tree, you got a gum tree, or you got stringy bark tree, we got stringy bark tree, and they got the same soils, and you got the same sort of values. 
And when we share those basic shared knowledge values, what we're actually doing is looking at the language that comes from landscapes. And the country always talking to us. It's talking to you all the time. And sometimes, you know, like all the time, the country is talking subtle to us constantly, beautiful little whispers that comes through the wind, that comes through the, the climate, that comes through the flowers, that comes through everything on the landscape. And those little whispers are always there and that constant conserva um, conserva um, talking to us, you know. And then she can raise her voice, and, you know, and she can say, hey, start looking after the country. And then she can go, hey, stop looking, start looking after the country. And then she can sing out real loud, proper loud, just like she did with the fire. And just like she did in other ways and situations with the water, like now. And that's why that language is so important, because that is what tells us what to do. And over thousands of years, sustainability comes from listening to her. It doesn't come from um, what we think is right. It comes from what she tells us is right. And there's millions and millions of indicators throughout the landscape. And those indicators also, not only the la she talking to us, so she talking to the animals too. And all those animals understand what I'm talking about. Because those animals know this knowledge that we're talking about because they've evolved with people for thousands of years and people have been on country for thousands of years. So there's a relationship and that relationship between animals, people, country and all those things is what we're missing out on and, and it's inevitable that the human race have to start listening again to landscapes and that is something that has to happen. And when we start to do that, there's a wonderful magic that comes from there. There's a sense of people can see themselves. They see their reflection in the landscape. We start, they start to see how sick she is and how our society reflects that. And when we start to read landscape and start to look after ourselves and when we start to apply what she's telling us to do, we're not only healing her, but we're healing ourselves. And that language is a one thing. And it's not just through talking, it's not just through listening, it's through all the senses, it's through all the things. And what you see, it comes in all different shapes and forms. And when she is talking to us, we must listen. And when we look at the fifth element in terms of the universe, and when you look up, that it total intelligence that's coming from up there. It's amazing intelligence. And when he gets involved, that fellow there, that light, then we know we're really in trouble <laughs> because we've never been listening to her, so now he's going to step in. And it's all language. It's all telling us. And that's exactly what's evolved um, indigenous knowledge and culture and the ability to be sustainable for so long with the planet. It's about the earth being the boss. The country is the boss. You want me to keep going? Um, I'm going to come back to you uh, um, because what I what, be, we'll get you <laughs> to keep going. That's fantastic. I mean, I think just listening to Victor just in that brief introduction, it it, it really attests to how important this essay is and how um, grateful I feel for having read it. Um, Victor talking um, about healing, Jill, I was um, really interested because Victor yeah, talk, is talking about our relationship to country and needing to, to be on country, to feel it, to experience it. One of, the, um, one of the problems or one of the difficulties we face during the lockdown, of course, is that Aboriginal people in Melbourne were, were basically locked in our houses and some mob could get out maybe what, an hour a day on country but many of us couldn't. Um, how, do you think that, uh, how do you think that affected people not being able to get out and be on country? And what have we learned by the, through that process of how important country and healing are related to each other? Um, it, it had a big effect. I think it had a big, big effect on all people 
but in, in, in our case it had a big effect on because for us to be on country, to go back to country when things aren't right, um, if you don't already live on your country, it's, it's, it's part, that's part of the healing process. Um, and so what we see in coming out of all the lockdowns we've had and elders and even young people, um, uh, we've had a lot of mental health issues arising, suicide. Suicides haven't increased due to COVID, um, um, but not in our community. They've stayed the same uh, as they were prior to COVID, which is much higher than the non-Aboriginal community anyways. But that connection to country was vital during COVID and we tried to think outside the box as to how we could do that. You know, virtual doesn't do it really. <laughs> uh, um, but um, actually uh, having workers, frontline workers, deliver pack care packages, uh, being able to talk to the elders uh, outside the house um, and just to that care factor. But I think, I think apart from the mental health and the SEWB, uh, out of the Royal Commission uh, mental health inquiry that was just released uh, in this state, um, their, their plans are to overhaul the whole mental health system. But one, two of the things that we, that the Aboriginal community were lucky enough to achieve was we've got two healing centres, even though two's not enough, but it's better than nothing. Um, so we've got the task now of developing what those healing centres look like and how can we marry today's, you know, the, um, the, the, the Western way, the clinical model that deals with mental health care, how can we marry it with culture? How can we marry it with our cultural ways of healing? That's, what, that's our challenge now and I think it's a really important challenge. But going back, Victor, in Victor's uh, opening um, comments there, uh, was quite inspiring and, and I thank you for that. Um, but, you know, how, how Mother Earth talks to you and it, it is so real. Uh, I mean, up where we're from, Tony, uh, and I'm not sure whether it's across the board and maybe Victor can tell me, but we have six seasons. We don't have four seasons like we do now. We have six seasons uh, and those seasons are the drying out time uh, and that's mainly when the north wind blows and the heat starts to dry out all the seeds uh, and so on. And then, of course, we've got the big dry and the big dry is when the real heat comes and uh, the water holes start to dry up. So, and it goes on and goes on. I'm not going to go through them. But the point is we had a different way of looking at how to see the Mother Earth talking to us, how you see that, how you feel that, how you taste that and how you hear that. Uh, and I think that's the crucial point. Okay. Thank you. Um, Tammy, again, um, I, I, again, I struck by you talking about Nan's country and watching and witnessing what I would see as the incredible vitality of women working together. Um, and again, I... I'm not discounting that men are involved in it, but seeing the women, how have you seen the, your work and work within your community on country of itself being part of being able to, to heal your, your nation? Because I was saying um, earlier that I know from, you know, story from, um, from authorities and elders within the Watharong, but also historical work, here we're talking about a nation that suffered terrible onslaught of colonial violence, just shocking violence um, in the 19th century. So how is the relationship between healing and the work that you do interconnected? Yeah, it's, um, it's really diverse, I must say, and there's a lot, lot to it. But I think, you know, for me, we had a three generational gap that our um, culture was uh, uh, really not spoken of. And unfortunately for me and, you know, my family, we missed out on so much that wasn't handed down to us. And, you know, through that weaving workshop that we did with the elders, um, that was a way for us to reconnect with one another 
but also try and heal us together as one one mob. And, um, you know, some of the elders said, oh, I remember making that when I was a little girl. You know, mum rem remembers stories of sitting on the beach um, making little necklaces out of the little shells. And they didn't realise that they were actually doing cultural practice back when they were younger, but they never really recognised it because we were, um, you know, it was a reality of that long silence and, um, you know, that's really unfortunate. But for all the women to come together, it's really empowering. Um, you know, we have old history story or writings of our women who carried fire along our river, especially from where, up where I live um, on the Yarra Wee. Um, the Wee means fire. Um, or whim, as we call it. But it's all, you know, everything has a purpose. And as we say, this healing of coming together and creating something that was, you know, our culture, we were, our culture was taken away, but creating something like the ill traps that I create is, um, it's unreal. And, you know, for that one of the ill traps that we did make, we had to apply for a cultural fishing permit to put it in the water to showcase that, you know, this type of thing is what my old people did, but we, there's so many red tape and flags and different things that policy we have to go through to actually be able to practice our culture as Aboriginal people. And um, I always refer, refer back to the Human Rights Charter that, you know, Aboriginal people have a right to practice their culture. And, um, you know, I strongly live by that in the work that I do. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so, Victor, I mean, your, your book, Fire Country, and you, you touch on it in this essay, I'd like now to, I would like to move to a bit of a discussion specifically on fire. And one, again, a really, I think, instructive um, quote in the essay is, fire provides the indicators of renewal, so the vitality. Um, I've seen you talk about this on television as well. I think it might have been on Q&A, but one of the things I think that you were, you've presented is that people have a misunderstanding of what cultural burning is. So they refer to that old, you know, fire stick farming. Um, I suppose it's a two-sided question. What are the, the I, I suppose, the misunderstandings from whitefellas about what fire technology does? And when you talk about fire being vital of those indicators of renewal, what are they? Well, people have a, a conception of fire, and it's all been developed by the way that you think, and while the way that people have been taught to think. And you know, when we look at you know that word colonization, you know, when we people look at that word, they think, see how Aboriginal people have been affected by colonization, and they always think how Aboriginal people have been affected by that. But you all been affected by that. That's why you're scared of the fire. That's why you don't know the country. And that's why um, we have this society has a whole um, perspective of the landscape that is totally opposite to what you should be knowing. And the understanding of the landscape, you've been deprived from that. And it isn't to blame anyone here. It's, the, just, it's how you've been taught to think. And it all comes back to thinking in circles. And that is the key. We're not in straight lines. And so when you look at fire now, for example, it's seen as hazard reduction. Save the house. And that's all it's ever going to be if we think that way. And that's where the fear sits. It's going to burn us. It's going to chase us. And it will burn you and it will chase you if you don't look after the country. And so it links to so, mo so much more. But when we look at fire in the sense of the cultural thing, and when we look at a fire and you want to know the real answers to fire, all you got to do is turn it upside down. What's the opposite of fear? It's like to be engaged and loved and to have confidence. And that is exactly how everything works. And that's why the, the paper that I've done for this one for the Wheeler Centre is really going back to the basics. It's going back to the basics for people to understand that the country is us. And there is so much out there that, that, that resembles us. 
And you might not think, oh, this is Aboriginal land, yeah, and respecting people and place, that's right. But it reflects all of us. And when we see fire as a fear, we can't do that. Because what it does in the cultural sense is look after the animals, it looks after the trees, it looks, makes the food come back. The fire was for taka, burning for food, that's why. And all the other benefits come there, the hazard reduction. You know, I hate saying say no that word, sorry. But stopping the wildfires, you know, burning for the biodiversity. You know, you see Western science now, they listen to us and then they say, well, now it's burning for biodiversity. Then we got hazard reduction over here and cultural burning over this way and the greenies over there that hate fire over there. And it's all separated. And that's where the problem lies. And that separation is exactly what colonisation has done to you, us all. So over time to this point today, right to this very day, we we're all suffering from the effects of how we've been made to think. That has nothing to do with the landscape. It has nothing to do with the country out there that you're sitting around. And forget about COVID. You've been separated from landscape ever since day one. And so it's about getting that connection back again. And it's about giving those people the baby steps to move forward. And just the simple concepts of understanding who you are and that the country is so much like us. The Mother Earth, she has the veins like us, the rivers. And in the essay, I mentioned the bronchioles in our lungs. They look like trees. And they do the same thing, make the air and put air into our bodies. And when we, when we hurt ourselves, when we go to Mother Earth out there and we dig all the earth out, we do that and take a big hunk of flesh out of us, that's scarred there till we die. And when we look at our, what makes us up, we need oxygen, we need water, we need food. Same thing. She needs the same thing. It's a living being. The planet is a living being. That's why it's just called mother. The one word, mother. And that's why it's so important that people understand that that's you, that's us, on the whole collective. When we look at ourselves as well, like what's inside of us, it's the same way. We need different organs to, to live. Same with the country. It needs different ecosystems and different, all different types of country. And all those different landscapes all contribute to a diversity that creates life. And that's a simple step of just understanding that it reflects us and it is us. And when we look inside ourselves, we have good and bad bacteria the good bacteria and the bad bacteria that fights, and when we get sick, the good bacteria fights. That's what it's like now for Mother Earth, when we look at all the billions of people on the country, They're all over the planet now. It's like we're like good and bad bacteria, all of us humans now. It's like we've got good bacteria trying to save the planet, we've got bad bacteria trying to eat it away and destroy it. So the good bacteria tries to get the, the healing happening and the bad bacteria fights back. And it's just the same thing that makes us up. And if, we, if the bad bacteria wins, we get sick. Same. And that's why we've got to start being not good and bad bacteria, we've got to start being the red and the white blood cells. Where two different colours, two different cells work together to keep one body alive, healthy. Just like inside you. The red and the white blood cells, one that fights the bacteria, one that puts the oxygen into our bloodstreams. That's what we've got to become, a better society. And knowing that we are contributing all the time. And that's the key with, with the ongoing, uh, with culture, is how we contribute. And I believe that's possible whether you live here in the city or whether you live out in a remote area, we can all contribute. And it's just giving us um, the way forward. And we can talk about it all you want. But it's not just the talking, it's the doing. And that's why in Aboriginal teaching methodologies, it's about the practical. It's about the fraction. The action that you apply to country that is good for everything. And we can all contribute no matter who we are, where we're from, in respect of people and in respect of place. 
and um, they're the examples that go forward from here. And fire is just the beginning. Fire is just the first door to open. And it's something that I never chose, fire. It chose us. It chose me. It chose the elders. And the reason why the fire is there is because we can't open the other doors if the land is sick. And now the water down there and all the areas, you look where the water's falling, all that flood, right where the fire was last year. What happens when you get burnt? You go under the tap, eh? And for a long time, put that water over you, burn for a long time. That's what's happening now. Mother Earth, oh, look, burnt, scarred skin. Put all the water, the healer up, trying to start that healing process. It's an amazing thing. And like I say, it's not just the seasons, it's not just um, the flowering of plants, it's everything. It's so much out there. And even the, the sickness is language. And, the, and what's happening to the landscapes is language for us. It's, um, and they're the things that we want to see um, teaching our young people. And the only way that can be happening is by us doing it and um, making it happen. So it's all about the practical. Because people are all about, yeah, we know about fire, we know what it does, but how do you do it? And I hear questions up here today. How do we make this happen? How? The answer is in the practical and doing the how. And that's where it's so important that we have the indigenous knowledge system there, one of the oldest knowledge systems in the world. It's not just about an Aboriginal owned knowledge system, it's about an example from humanity that is demonstrating the pathway forward. And so that's why get off the stage, get out on country and start making it happen. And when we apply that and the land heals and the that's Mother Earth telling us, good on you, you're doing it. Look, here comes back the emu, here comes back the berries. Here, look, you've got grass now instead of dead leaf litter on the ground. All these things like that. And that's what I've been taught and, and that's what needs to be shared um, to move forward and tackling all these massive, um, you know, um, tasks that are ahead of us, these challenges that are ahead of us. You know, it's an exciting time. That's why I'm smiling. <laughs> because it's not doom and gloom. We've got to think, if we can work with the land, she'll then heal and she'll, she'll get better. If you get sick, if you're on your own to get, to get better, it takes you longer. So you go doctor, the doctor speeds it up for you. And it's the same thing. When she's sick, then we've got to, she needs help. She needs love too, you know. And she likes it when people love her because she's had people with her for thousands of years. Um, Victor's coming home with me. Um, yeah. <laughs> going to get him to talk to all my kids. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, round of applause, please, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, um, we've only got um, five minutes left, um, unfortunately, for this session. But I want to... Um, put a question to um, Jill and Tammy in response to um, Victor's gentle and wonderful provocation because what Victor ends with, and he's talked about a little bit here, is that he's asking us to work with each other. So he talks about the vitality of many cultures of youth today, young people getting involved in these issues. Victor writes that this is not a black-white issue. Now, while of course we recognise the centrality and the authority of Indigenous knowledge, which Victor just mentioned, he makes the really important remark, cleaning up the mess is important no matter who is responsible. And we know who is responsible and what is responsible in what industries, but I think Victor is asking us to work together, to, do, to be active. So um, to Jill and then to Tammy, um, accepting that you work centrally within your own mob, what are, what's the potential or what do you see as the possibilities of engaging with and working with non-Aboriginal people on the issues that concern you both about protection of both people, culture and country? Uh, uh, what opportunities? Yeah. Uh, I, I think if there's a willingness, there's always opportunities. Um, I don't know how we make that happen. Um, Victor's uh, comments just then resonate with a lot of people and not only Aboriginal people um, uh, in relation to 
uh, Aboriginal ways of looking after country, Aboriginal ways of being able to read country um, uh, and know when, when, when you need to do burning, uh, know when what season's in play uh, and a whole gamut of, you know, the, the, the six seasons that I spoke about earlier. Um, the flowering time uh, was between August and November. I mean, we've got to remember we didn't have a written history or a written... Uh, as we know it today, by the way, we, we had other signs, but in, in relation to knowing what seasons are in play and then what that means uh, for the ongoing uh, well-being of uh, your community. Um, and I think that's really interesting how we can, how we can, so I'll use the, the word marry, how we can marry ancient ways with modern ways, how it can be complemented or can it be complemented? That's the question. Uh, I mean, I remember my a great uncle from Gunai Kurnai country, which is Gippsland. Um, he said to me once, I was travelling through Gippsland and he basically says, Jill, do you know how to read Mother Earth? And I said, well only what some of the elders have told me about. He says, well, he said, do you know when there's going to be the big wet happening? I said, well, what's the big wet, Unc? He said, well, the big wet is when we're going to have a lot of rain. He said, do you know how to tell how much rain we're going to get? And I said, no, tell me. He said, see that um, swan's nest over there in the middle of the lake? Depending how high they build that nest... If it's very high, it's going to be a lot of rain. <laughs> if it's very low, there's not going to be much rain. He said, you see the signs, you've got to know how to read the signs. And then you've got to know what to do about the signs. Uh, and I think that's the challenge in a modern world, how we do that. And Tammy? Um, I think, um, I think is having that confidence to get your voice heard and you know, feel confident in the actions that you do. And I speak for, uh, from that, um, from the heart of being a mother and, um, you know, just take that forward and don't be afraid to speak up. Because I learnt, um, you know, I always sat at the back of the room and I always absorbed everything like a big sponge. But now I have that confidence and that knowledge to take me forward and to speak up. And I think um, if we can, you know, exert our rights for self-determination, I think that five, ten years' time, we have a great future. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to ask for a big round of applause in a moment, but I have other housekeeping issues to deal with. Just the first one, the most important one. As I said, um, Victor Stephenson's also written a remarkable book, Fire Country. Um, the book is available here and Victor's available to talk to and to sign the book, so I'd urge you to do that because what Fire Country does is not only expand on um, some issues that are introduced in the essay, but of course, many other issues that are vital to us as well, so please do that. Um, the other issue is that being, again, a, a very conscious, um, health-conscious event around COVID safety, um, when we finish formally, it's important that you leave the, um, the area, the um, audience area, um, quickly but diligently. Don't, we don't need a stampede. Um, we're going to have a deep cleaning of um, all the audience area so that in 15 minutes um, everyone can come back in. So please do that. Um, in closing, though, I just want to say um, we're talking before. This is, I think, if not the first, one of the very first um, Wheeler events since um, COVID where we've been able to gather as a community together. And I think it's fantastic that this day is dedicated to these absolutely vital issues. And I think we're um, incredibly fortunate to kick off the day and to kick off the year for the Wheeler Centre to have three remarkable, um, very generous speakers. So um, in closing, I, I want to personally say thank you so much to Tammy, to Jill and to Victor. Um, I've learned so much just in this hour and I feel um, incredibly um, grateful to have shared the stage with you and I would like everyone to
give a round of applause to these three great people. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and around the world.